Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of the West Indies. Good morning. In a year that brought us a migrant crisis, earthquakes, raging floods, the vivid demonstration of climate change in Hurricane Dorian, and even promises for cannabis marijuana reform, it is apparent that the world as we know it has changed. So this year's theme, Transformation for Enhanced Delivery, is indeed timely. The worlds in which courts and lawyers operate are also changing, increasing the parameters of justice, whether it be cybercrime, cryptocurrencies, virtual reality, LGBT issues, bullying, gangs, or cricket. Just this week, the Ministry of Labor held a consultation to propose new laws on migrant workers finally accepting that we can no longer bury our heads in the sand with regard to the thousands of migrant neighbors on our shores. More and more, the public calls upon the legal system to find solutions for emerging and enduring problems. Every time disaster strikes, I worry that I should have been a doctor or an engineer or even a construction worker so I could directly intervene. Where is the lawyer, judge, magistrate in all of this? At times, law can seem esoteric, at least our modern understanding of law, but scratch below the surface and see how lawyering is vital here too the breakdown of law and order, looting, building codes, insurance, etc., all rely on law. Soon as we saw in Bermuda after their hurricane, sophisticated issues of land reform and ownership will emerge, challenging the very status quo so carefully constructed over hundreds of years and requiring innovative responses for a changed landscape. It is not that we here in Trinidad and Tobago are standing still, not at all. The objective observer can hardly avoid noticing the deep and several changes in our judicial system in very recent times. New courts, new processes, and cutting edge technological advances. These are indeed very impressive. We have seen the much needed operalization of children's courts, bringing to bear the social objectives of rehabilitation and care, particularly to our vulnerable children that we have long paid only lip service to. It also insulated such children from the harsh realities of the magistrate's courts and have the additional advantage of lessening the overload there. We even now have traffic courts, a welcome development. We have seen a new online cutting edge court case management system, the Trinidad and Tobago Judicial Information Management System, TTGIM. Among other things, it facilitates searches and creates case information on cases for all of the courts. The development of court pay, making payments easier through an online electronic payment system is also a welcome initiative. This is an example of process reform aimed at increasing efficiency and service delivery, as well as improving safety, accessibility, and convenience. The introduction of online probate searches should also be mentioned. I am pleased to see that TT Gym is currently being developed further for expansion into the magistrate's court and is being rolled out to the magistrate in phases, beginning with the criminal and traffic jurisdiction. Regrettably, the magistrate has far too often been seen as the poor cousin in the judiciary, whereas, in fact, it is the fulcrum of justice. The vast majority of persons who treat with the judicial system will do so through the magistrate. 
If we are serious about access and equality in our justice system, it is incumbent upon us to put in place radical reforms to the magistrate. Justice should really not be measured by dollars and cents. The dignity of obtaining redress and being heard abounds, whether it is $100 or $1 million, particularly for a poor man or woman accustomed to being marginalized in our class-based societies. We are all familiar with the issues that affect the magistrate's court's performance. Poorly designed information systems, lack of a customer focus, a reliance of manual procedures despite the excessive volume of cases, lack of standard or efficient procedures, particularly in data, overload and of course resource constraints. Access to justice is not prioritized. Justice is slow and wieldy all of which cause frustration and alienation to those who seek redress. I have no doubt that TT Jim will improve the magistracy's ability to supervise time and events from the beginning of cases to their finalization. Automated case flow will provide crucial information to trace and track cases. More importantly, it introduces accountability within our judicial system, something which the public has been clamoring for. Performance can be measured with regard to timeliness, equality, independence, and fairness. Such accountability can go a long way to secure integrity, expand access to justice, and help build much needed public trust and confidence in the system. It is time to bring the magistracy's antiquated system into the 21st century to better meet the challenges of contemporary society and to ensure that it is front and center of our judicial system. Perhaps most impactful from the public's point of view, however, is a recent initiative undertaken to address the backlog of criminal cases in the criminal courts. Not only did the judges of the criminal court dispose of several matters by trial or plea, but the change resulted in hundreds of persons coming to court for status hearings, maximum sentence indications, and case management directions, making an important dent in the backlog plaguing the system. The maximum sentence hearings and bail monitoring program and status hearings is an example of a transforming initiative that returns sanctity to the judicial system. These initiatives will surely go a long way to meet the challenges of the implementation de deficit and an under-resourced judiciary and JLSC so often lamented about. The focus on specialization in our courts is also an important reform. The progress made with the children's court and legislation on children is nothing short of remarkable and addresses a dire and somewhat shameful social malaise with regard to how this society treats its children. I look forward to seeing meaningful statistics from these courts, an often overlooked component in our administration of justice. These should be stratified by race, gender, disability, and socioeconomic background, to name a few, so that we can begin to understand what is truly happening with our nation's children who fall off the grid. Many years ago, I did a consultancy for UNICEF in Barbados and was amazed simply by speaking to officials to learn of a discernible link between so-called juvenile delinquency and dyslexia and other learning disabilities. As far as I'm aware, this has never been interrogated in a systematic way, and it will certainly require appropriate data which we can now provide if there is a foresight to do so. 
socioeconomic questions are also clearly relevant to this issue. As a labor lawyer, I look forward to hearing more about the industrial court, though I recognize, of course, its autonomy. I do not for one moment accept that the court is too skewed in favor of workers. But undoubtedly, the industrial relations climate has deteriorated in Trinidad and Tobago. Moreover, the very place of unions and workers' rights is being quite amazingly questioned today. Recently, I heard a poll asking if we still need unions. We have traversed very far from the gains of Tupoli Raya Buzz Butler and seem to have forgotten the lessons of the past. I believe the industrial court now has an important educative function today and cannot only focus on its purely judicial role. In sum, transformation demands more than procedural and technological advances. We are at a juncture where the substantive tenets of the law and the judicial system are at risk. There is still so much more work to do despite these excellent right steps. Next week, my faculty will lead a delegation to present a hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on remand issues, particularly as they apply to women on remand who have been arrested for murder, but who were in fact victims of domestic violence and who now languish in our jails, some for more than 10 years. There are many other troubling issues that we must confront. So we are in the middle of an unfinished journey in transformation. I acknowledge fully that trying to lead transformation is a difficult exercise, and sometimes we are tempted to kill the messenger. It is much easier to remain in comfortable cocoons, particularly where change will disturb our bread and butter. Many of us remain entrenched in traditional ways of doing things that may no longer be suited to present day realities. More importantly, however, I underscore that despite all of these impressive initiatives, there will only be genuine transformation if each one of us does his or her part. True transformation requires collective responsibility. It is necessary, but not sufficient, to look to the state and judicial administrators to drive change. Improved technology and procedural mechanisms certainly provide an excellent platform for improved efficiencies, but they will come to naught if we still take on more cases than we can handle, if we engage in unnecessary adjournments, if we settle cases without appropriate consultations with clients and which cover only our costs and little else, little else and the list can go on. <coughs> I'm sorry. In this society, we have a tendency to believe that lack of ethical standards are restricted to financial impropriety or tangible benefits. Not so. All of the above, inappropriate conduct, bring into play ethics. I have always believed that as legal practitioners, we have a duty to spearhead transformation, not just to make systems more efficient, but in ways that bring about change that will uplift our societies. In this hallowed and sacred space, I also think about our craft and how it squares with our spiritual purpose. In preparing for this address, this led me inevitably perhaps to the Bible, only because I'm a Christian and more familiar with it, but just as easily we could look to the Quran and other holy books. Not surprisingly, lawyers and tax collectors are among the most criticized persons in the holy book. In Luke 11, Jesus was explaining that the second greatest law was, love your neighbor as yourself, he said. 
And you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves did not lift one finger to help them. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world. Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. Sobering words. But how do we enter that sacrosanct space? How do we locate that noble mission that we are called upon to initiate? How can we engage in the collective engagement that will bring about real transformation to our societies? It is true that in those times, the lawyers were not as we know them today, but religious leaders who instructed on the faith Indeed, the Quran is still the source of Islamic law and faith, so lawyers have an indispensable role in defining the path of a Muslim. So from time immemorial, the law and lawyers were intricately bound up with defining that road map for spirituality and goodness, seeing these as instrumental in the lawyering and judicial functions. I believe that some of that calling remains, if only we can harness it. Like many of you, perhaps, I myself constantly struggle with my own sense of purpose. Every day I wake, I ask for direction to locate the ways in which my career path can be meaningful to the collective whole. Whether a judicial system or an individual practitioner, Perhaps we need to constantly remind ourselves of our true roles as upholders and shapers of the law. So yes, these judicial reforms are indispensable changes which will go a long way to correct the harsh inequities and inefficiencies of the system. Yet, I ask for more if we are to have true transformation. Our laws and justice system remain alienating and inaccessible. There is a large degree of mistrust, cynicism, and lack of confidence in the administration of justice. Many also believe that the justice system is inherently biased towards those who have, while the have-nots are lost in the system. Whether we are speaking of bail or remand or children or sentences, the accusation is the same. Real transformation requires that we address this. There is need for a paradigm shift towards a system that is genuinely caring and offers solutions that are relevant to people's lives that can make a difference. We must also find a way to engage the public with the justice system where the masses interact with the judicial system, assured in the knowledge that it is focused on their needs. These are not easy tasks and requires the kind of transformation that is grounded in attitudinal shifts and philosophical grounding. Justice must also reach those it seeks to serve. Currently in Trinidad and Tobago, lawyers' fees are too high, in my humble opinion. As a Caribbean woman, I am conscious that they are among the highest, if not the highest, than anywhere else in the Caribbean. I wonder this is partly because, although there has been a fused profession for over three decades, we are still clinging on to the division, instructing attorneys and so on, resulting in two sets of, of fees, which is not necessarily the case anywhere else in the region. Lawyers' fees are directly related to the quality of our justice system and how the citizenry can participate in it. Is it time, for example, for contingency fees? We all think that we deserve high fees and high status because, after all, we studied hard. We deserve it. However, our ability to demand such an elevated place in society came at a social cost. Our successes are not only because of our individual merit, 
but bears a direct relationship to the sacrifices that the society made on our behalf. Student loans, gate, and collective decisions by the state all played a part in our legal education. Not long ago, only the very wealthy could become attorneys. It is still that way in many countries. Should the spoils be for us alone? There are many ordinary citizens out there who also have the right to be heard, the right to participate and obtain a remedy in our judicial system based on the merit of their cases. But they are prohibited from doing so simply because it is too expensive. We should cultivate not an individualistic perspective, but a life's work consciousness that we all have a part to play in improving the social malaise we find ourselves in. Access to justice is therefore not merely about the state ensuring that there are more judges and resources and technology and procedural mechanisms. It is a collective responsibility. We all have a part to play in that goal. Both procedural and substantive amendments to laws are necessary in this endeavor. Of course, this should also mean stimulating avenues for stakeholders in the justice system to be able to engage fully right up to the appeal level where warranted. Procedural obstacles and high fees will be counterproductive to this objective. It is recognized too that our common law system is premised on inherent conflict and a penchant to win at all costs which does not augur well for a collective will to bring about true transformation. It is an impulse that we must constantly resist. The social purpose of the lawyer, the judge, the police officer, the court official must be toward a commitment to working towards improving and reforming the system. If we do not continually work towards reform, the system will become meaningless and even harmful. We can ill afford to be comfortable observers sitting on the fence. Moreover, legal practitioners and judges may fail to see the larger picture if bogged down in legal technicalities and a too pedantic approach to lawyering. I have spoken elsewhere of the rule of law as opposed to the more barren ruling by laws. Today, the attorney, the judge, must have deep understandings of the nuances and sophisticated concepts that are relevant to our society and which must underpin lawyering and judicial making. Whether these be diversity, inequalities in the justice system, citizen insecurity, disability, and the like. These are important lessons in particular for the criminal justice system corrupted often by delay and profit, which prioritize rich man's justice. These issues are compounded by the apathy that attends the increasing undermining of rights disproportionately against the already marginalized because of citizen insecurity in the face of crime. I am not suggesting that we should go out there and be Miss Pollyanna do good, but I sincerely believe that there is a minimum irreducible core of lawyering that dictates that we become fully engaged for the common good. Throughout history, legal reform has underpinned every great social transformation and often spearheaded it. And we can either be casual onlookers until we are jolted in reality or work with a collective spirit to shape the society we want to live in. In this year's Distinguished Jurist Lecture by the President of Howard University, I was struck by the reminder that it was the lawyers and judges of the time, buoyed by a strong social commitment to equality and justice, who systematically fought for change by bringing legal challenges to the unjust paradigm of racism. This ultimately brought about law reform, casting out discriminatory laws resulting in the Civil Rights Act. Far too often, we see law and lawyering and the justice system as simply reactive. We respond to problems as they arise. 
Perhaps this is the inevitable fallout from a common law system that grew up in an ad hoc manner as issues arose to be determined by the chancellor. This is in direct contrast to the civil law systems where law is proactive and designed to meet deeply thought out philosophical values and ideals such as equality and liberty. But in a world which now constantly challenges so many of our deeply held beliefs and assumptions, perhaps the time is now to take a different approach. At its core, our judicial system must be a humanizing and equalizing force in society. It must be able to reach and understand our reality, imbued as it is with its own peculiar historical and social circumstances. And despite the challenges of constant flux, even the sustainable development goals presume that law and human rights are at the heart of social development and transformation. Are we to be architects of law and justice? helping to build the societies we want and deserve, or mere technicians, plying our trade with a dispassionate expertise and no thought for the bigger picture. One of my favorite mantras comes from the first black president of Howard University, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, who said, a lawyer is either a social engineer or he is a parasite on society. Which are you? Will you be part of the transformation that has begun? Thank you.